The church is the hope of the world. But too often nowadays, the light of the church is dimmed by things like culture wars, infighting, division, even abusive behavior from many who claim the name of Christ. But it isn't meant to be this way. Join us as we turn to the book of Acts and find what happens when regular people are unfazed because of the spirit of the risen Jesus. His power is still available to us today, and it's a power that can turn our world upside down. Good morning, everyone, and let me add uh, to the greeting you've already received how grateful we are that you are here today, whether you are watching online or here in the room with us on our Frisco campus. As Paul said, we're coming to the end of our study in the book of Acts, and we've entitled the overarching title for this entire series is Turning the World Upside Down. And today, I wanted to answer the question what kind of leader can God use to really turn the world upside down? And if you've been with us for a while, you know that I'm probably talking about the Apostle Paul. He is the kind of leader that God used to literally turn the world upside down for centuries. Now, in his lifetime, he probably started anywhere from 14 to 20 churches uh, he wrote 13 epistles or books that make up half of our New Testament. And in his writing, he essentially redefined or really defined the whole Christian message, the message of Jesus. And as a result of that, his influence is still at work today as literally billions of people read his letters and their hearts are touched and shaped. But here's the thing, if you saw the Apostle Paul today, he wouldn't look anything at all like a celebrity pastor. He wouldn't look at anything at all like someone you'd probably want to hang out with. He is self-deprecating, he talks about his looks, not really impressive, and he's all not that much of a great speaker, he would say to himself, and yet there was something about his leadership that allowed the Spirit to use him in such a way that the world could be transformed and turned upside down. Well, today we're gonna to be looking at a number of verses found in Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through chapter 23, 22. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your device, please turn there. We're not gonna speed read through it. I'm gonna do a little paraphrase quickly through there. And then as I walk through some of his leadership attributes and strategies, we'll be picking and choosing from some of these verses, all right? So when you open your Bible to Acts 21, beginning of verse 17, Paul uh, has just arrived in Jerusalem. Last week, Paul, the co-senior pastor, not Paul, the apostle, you know, he talked about this last meeting that Paul had with his friends and elders in Ephesus. And now, as we open up today, Paul is in Jerusalem. And uh, when he arrives, he meets with James, the half-brother of Jesus, and they get together and they share all the incredible things that God is doing. Paul talks about how God is transforming the lives of Gentiles. And then James says, hey, by the way, there are literally thousands of Jews who have now begun to follow Jesus as the Messiah. And then they celebrate that together. But then James goes, but Paul, I need to tell you something. Uh, the people here who were Jews who are now followers of Jesus, they're really serious about the law of Moses. And they heard that you're telling people among these Gentile believers, the Jews there, that they don't really need to follow the law of Moses anymore and the temple's not that important. And you know, you can kind of give up some of the customs. And when they find out you're here, you may run into some trouble. And so James says, here's what I think we probably should do. I've got four guys who are finishing up a temporary Nazarite vow. They're going to be going to the temple for a purification rite. And when they're done, they're going to shave their heads. And I want you to go with them, shave your head. And I want you to pay for the barber. It's rather expensive, but that'll let them know that you affirm the law of Moses. Paul says, all right, I'm in. 
He goes, and unfortunately while he's there, there are some Jews from Ephesus, the Ephesus area, who knew Paul and knew what he said, and they start a ruckus. And I mean, they're calling down fury and fire, and before long, Paul's life is in danger. They grab him, take him out of the temple, slam the door shut behind him, and as they're about to try to kill him, thankfully, some Roman soldiers see him, they go get the commander, and they come and they rescue Paul. I mean, he almost lost it right then and there. He gets in the safety of the fortress, the Roman fortress, and Paul asks if he can, hey, can I just defend myself to all these people? And the commander says, yes, you can. So Paul goes back out, he quiets the crowd, and he begins to simply tell them his story. And everything is going swimmingly, and it seems like he's you know, he's influencing the jury of his peers until he gets to the last part. And he says, and then God called me to go and speak the gospel to the Gentiles. And when he does it, man, they just erupt again. They're ripping their clothes off. They're throwing dirt in the air. And Paul knows he is now in trouble. They whisk him back inside the fortress. And then he is safe. And the Commander's trying to figure out what's going on here, and he allows Paul the next day to appear before the council made up of Pharisees and Sadducees to try to get at what's going on here. Well, it's a wonderful depiction of Paul's intelligence because he is standing before the Jewish council, Pharisees and Sadducees. You need to know something about them. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and they were at odds about that. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The only reason why they were together is because of the Apostle Paul, and he knew that. Now, here's the deal. Here's the way you can remember this. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they are sad, you see, okay? <laughs> the Pharisees, they believe in the resurrection. That's why they are fair, you see. All right, so they're there to judge Paul, but Paul goes, hey, before we go any further, I want you to know that I'm here and I'm being judged because I believe in and I teach the resurrection. And the Pharisees go, hey, he's not so bad after all. And then the Sadducees go, I can't believe that. And they actually start fighting themselves and Paul is able to slip out with the guards for another day. However, at that point in time, there are about 40 people who swear that they will not eat or sleep again until they kill Paul. So they're going to, they set up a conspiracy to assassinate him. Thankfully, Paul's nephew finds out about it, tells Paul, and because of that, they're able to whisk him away to Caesarea to safety. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. There's that story, but deep in that story are some of the aspects of the apostle Paul's leadership. And I hope that as I lay those out for you today, that you'll begin to sense how important leadership can be and also how you can also be a leader. That's why I want to ask you to ask yourself two important questions today. Here's the first one. What kind of leaders do you want to follow? That's a really important question in our culture today. I mean, it just seems like in terms of spiritual leaders, there's an expose on Hillsong right now. I've been watching that. The Duggar family, there's an expose on them coming up. And they're kind of led astray by another kind of cultic teacher leader. We have moral failings and we have controversy. Even in the state of Texas, we have political failures, it would seem. And so as we look around us, we have opportunities to, to follow leaders, whether it's at work or whether it's at school or whether it's a team we're on. The question I want to ask you is, what kind of leader do you really want to follow? It's really important that you understand that and comprehend that. Here's the second thing, and I think this is probably even more important. What kind of leader do you want to become? You may not have an official leadership position anywhere, but you have influence in your family, with those with whom you work, in your neighborhood. You are a leader. There is more leadership being done by people who are not in official capacities of leadership. You're a leader. You're an influencer. And you have to decide what kind of leader you want to become. So to, to begin and kind of unpack some of that, I want to... 
uh, ask you another question. What is the task of a leader? You know, what is it that a leader does? And here's a wonderful quote that I've, I've known for a while. It goes like this. A leader is someone who tells you what you do not want to hear, who helps you see what you don't want to see, so you can become what you've always known you could be. Now, this is a quote from the Apostle Thomas Landry of Dallas Cowboy fame. Not, not the Gospel of Thomas, but Tom Landry. Now, here's the deal. The Apostle Paul does this incredibly well. He tells people what they need to hear, and he helps them see what they never thought they would see, and they follow him, and their lives are transformed by Jesus. But there were many people who did not like what he said, and they did not like the vision that he portrayed. And as a result of that, they said, there's no way I'm ever going to become something other than who I am and that made them uncomfortable, even hostile. Why? Because he was upsetting their belief systems in life. And that is never an easy thing to do. Thus, all the commotion, all the controversy, all the opposition, all the persecution that Paul experienced because he was moving their cheese that is, he was causing them to focus on changing at the deepest parts of their lives. So here's something that you're probably aware of, but maybe not. Controversy and opposition follow leaders. If you're a leader, you're going to experience resistance and opposition, but that comes primarily for two reasons. Here's the first one. Sometimes leaders get opposition and controversy because they are immature leaders. That is, that their character and their maturity cannot bear up under the load of their success that came easily. Another group of leaders can also engender and create opposition, and these are leaders that are mature. That is, their giftedness and their success lines up with the quality of their character, and because of that, incredible things happen. So what is a mature leader? I think in my mind, that's the one thing, that's a quality that I always look for, I hope for in myself. So what is a mature leader? Here's a definition that I processed this week and hopefully it'll be helpful to you. A mature leader is ever developing in key aspects of their life, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, morally, and relationally. Now, here's what I want you to think about. You know, here's the thing. You can be a leader and you can be successful initially, but if you're not growing or you're not good in one of these areas, your leadership will crash. That is, we all know people who are very successful, but they have a moral failing and all, now all their leadership goes away. Or they are not emotionally mature and they can't control their thoughts and their speech and their action and they disqualify themselves by the way they react and those kinds of things. So all these are important aspects of leadership. And so what I want to do is I want to, to maybe help you see today Paul's mature leadership and how it allowed God to use him to turn the world upside down. So we're gonna talk about uh, these six areas in the Apostle Paul's life. And I think at the end of our time together, you will see why he was so effective and why God could use him. So here's the first thing. Mentally, Paul was a brilliant student and a strategist. Now, he was racing to the top of the pharisaical ladder before he met Jesus. He likely had memorized the first five books in the Old Testament as a young teenager. And he was a student of Gamaliel, think Ivy League. He was asked to be a student of the top rabbi in his day and in his age. And as you look at how he began to spread the message of the gospel, his strategy was genius. He would go to all of these cities in Asia Minor around the rim of the Mediterranean. And in every city, if there were 10 Jewish families, they could establish a synagogue. 
and he would go to the synagogue, and here's the reason why. He would speak the gospel to the Jews, but around every synagogue, there would be Gentiles who were spiritually minded, who were interested in God, and they were actually called God-fearers. I actually called them pain-fearers because they, they wanted to follow God, but they didn't want to be circumcised, and I don't blame them as adults. That would not be fun. So these Gentiles hung out around the synagogue, and so when Paul went there and began to speak about the gospel, they were low-hanging fruit. And these God-fearers told their two friends, and those two friends told their two friends, and so on and so on, and that was the way that Paul got into the Gentile communities where God was leading him to share the gospel. He was brilliant in that. Now, here's the thing. We often forget that Jesus edited the great commandment. Are you all aware of that? You know, when you look at the great commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, Moses writes, we are to love God, what? With our heart, our whole soul, and our strength. But when you go to Matthew's account of that, in Matthew 22, Jesus changes it and says, we're to love God with our whole heart, our souls, and our minds. And I think sometimes what happens is, as Christians, we think we have to be anti-intellectual, and we don't study and learn and become uh, masters of some particular discipline or whatever things we encounter in the world. So here's a question I want to ask you. When it comes to your leadership, are you growing mentally as a leader? As a parent, when's the last time you read a parenting book? You're leading in your marriage. When's the last time you really focused on some of the principles of marriage? You're leading in your classroom. You're leading as a coach. You're leading in business. When is the last time you really did a deep dive into your particular area to learn more and grow more? You're a spiritual leader in your group. When is the last time you did a deep dive into God's word and really began to to inculcate as much of it as you can in your own mind and heart. So the kinds of leaders that we want to follow are the ones who are really brilliant and strategic, and what God is calling you to be as a leader is to grow in your mental, intellectual capacity. Here's the second thing. Spiritually, Paul was clear about his calling and his convictions. After the ruckus at the temple, as I shared earlier, Paul asks to speak to the crowd, and he tells them his conversion story. And everything is going great. They are following with rapt attention until he recounts in verse 22, chapter 21, but the Lord said to me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And that is when they go hog wild. They're ripping off their clothes they're throwing dirt in the air. And what Paul is doing, this is the second occasion that this is appearing in the book of Acts. Paul is going to tell this story again in a couple of chapters. He is deeply embedded in this story of conversion. And he tells it again and again and again. He knows his deep sense of calling. God has called me to be a missionary of the Gentiles to take the good news to them. And if you look at the letter he wrote to the church in Galatia, chapter one, verses 15 through 16, he, he enumerates this for us. Here's what he says. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news, the grace of God, the grace that is demonstrated through the death of Jesus on our behalf about Jesus to the Gentiles. Paul is crystal clear about his calling. I've been called to share my life and the message of the gospel with Gentiles, and his convictions were centered around this whole idea of grace. It's no longer law. It's no longer obedience to get God's favor. It is the grace that comes to us through God's nature and demonstrated through Jesus. Do you know that in all of his letters, the word grace appears 80 times? It's all about grace, the goodness of God in Christ, 
And I'm going to share that with the Gentiles, that they are included. So here's the thing. Before Simon Sinek talked about knowing your why, Jesus, um, Paul knew his why. And his why was to go to the Gentiles. And that why helped him allocate his resources, his time, the way he spent his energy. But more than that, and sometimes I think we miss this, it was understanding his why and understanding that grace is at the heart of it that allowed him to persevere through some of the most painful challenging moments. Let me just list them for you. The apostle Paul was arrested on three occasions. On five occasions, he received 39 lashes. Just getting those once can kill you. I can't imagine what his back looked like. On three occasions, he was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead once. He was shipwrecked three times. And he spent a whole day and night floating in the Mediterranean waiting to be saved. I don't know about you, but like one of those whippings with a cat and nine tails, I'm kind of backing off a little bit. I'm not sure about my calling. But what enabled him to continue to push on was this deeply embedded sense of his calling. God's called me to be this and to do this. And it was based on grace. And so as these people were beating him and imprisoning him, his reaction was not judgment and hatred. It was grace. It was grace. Perseverance, I love this quote, is not a long race. It is many short races one after another. I think that's an accurate description of what perseverance is. He had to persevere between beatings, between arrests, all along, and it was knowing his why that enabled him to do that. So let me ask you, are you really clear about your why? Have you lost your why? Have you ever really discerned it under God what your why is in this life? You know, we're living during a time of what some people are calling the great resignation. Have you heard about that? You know, in 2021, 47 million people quit their job. In 2022, another 38 million quit their job. And now we have a new phenomenon called, you know what it is? Quiet quitting. People are kind of quitting in place. And people are quitting coming to church And people are quitting getting married now. And I think because of what we've been through, people are losing their sense of why they were made and what they've been called to and their sense of conviction. So let me ask you, have you lost your why? Have you lost touch with your guiding convictions in this time of struggle and the pandemic and all the disruptions around us? If you're going to be the leader that God is calling you to be in your home, where you work, where you go to school, where you play, the next thing you maybe need to do is to get in touch again with your why under God. Why are you here? What does he have in store for you? And what are your guiding convictions that are non-negotiable for you to live according to even in difficult times. So Paul, man, he grew. He was spiritually set. Here's the third thing. Emotionally, Paul was able to remain calm in the middle of a lot of chaos. And I mentioned earlier how they grabbed him out of the temple. And I, and I love this part of the story. I mean, they grab him, they pick him up, they slam the doors to the gate of the temple, and they are starting trying to kill him. The Roman soldiers come, they kind of quiet the crowd, and yet now they're, they're trying to bring Paul back into the fortress, but the crowd follows along, and there is so much yelling and so much screaming and so much cursing. They are so violent that the Roman soldiers have to lift Paul up and body surf him up the stairs into the fortress. And as soon as he gets in, Paul turns to the commander and says this, "Uh, hey, may I have a word with you? 
I mean, I, mean I, I couldn't speak. I don't know what, I probably would have needed to change some of my clothing because of all that. He, he just turns to the commander and goes, I, may, may I have a word with you? In the middle of all of that, he is able to maintain his emotional responses. I, I love what he does here. He actually speaks to this Roman commander in Greek. And it surprises the Roman commander. Oh, you know Greek? He is not hijacked by his emotions. He is able to experience and see what's going on. His view of reality is not distorted. He is able to think straight. His spirit is not closed off. He is able to go, hey, hey, can I have a word with you? There's an amazing power when people are able to remain calm in the middle of chaos. In verses 39 and 40 of 21, when he goes and speaks to the crowd, I want you to pick up again on how his calm demeanor impacted the crowd. Here's how Luke records it. Please, let me talk to these people. The commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. And soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. He goes from Greek to Aramaic and the highest <laughs> moment of stress and anxiety and worry. And what he does is his calmness calms the crowd with him. You know, one of the most important things that you can do as a leader, as a parent, as a friend, is that you can be the kind of person that lowers the level of anxiousness and worry. There's a, a wonderful uh, writer by the name of Ed Friedman who talks about the power of being what he calls a step-down transformer. Those of you who are engineers, you know what this is. Uh, you know, we have a lot of power lines here in Frisco that carry a lot of amps and a lot of volts. And what would happen if some of those largest electrical wires were plugged directly into your house? It would blow up your house. It would start on fire. But all those huge wires go into a series of step-down transformers. And now the power is stepped down to 220 or 110. And it goes into your house. And what happens? Everything works the way it's supposed to work. And so when people like Paul remain calm, even in the most chaotic times... It allows people to function and respond in ways that are healthier. So let me ask you this. When things get a little dicey around your office or your workplace or your home, are you a calming influence? Or do you accelerate and share all of that anxiety and all of the worry that's going on? If you want to become a better leader... You have to learn to regulate your own emotional reactivity. How do you do that? How do you work on that? Some of you, I know, probably need to work on that more than anything else here. And I would encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Here's what Paul writes. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And he will give you a sense of peace that exceeds human understanding. And he will guard your heart and mind in those crazy times through Jesus Christ, your Lord. That's how you can begin to do that. So I encourage you to begin to appeal to the presence and the firm foundation we sang about so that you can be like Paul in the worst of times. Here's the next one. Morally, Paul's character was impeccable. It was amazing the things that he did. I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 20, the verse or the chapter that Paul, my co-senior pastor, not Paul the apostle, that Paul talked about last week. Okay, it's, it's that chapter. Here's what uh, Luke writes there. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. That is, Paul never would have been put up on preacher sneakers on the internet. 
You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now here's the thing. There were no missionary sending organizations when Paul went out around the world. He had no people to raise support from. He went out and he made tents and repaired tents and he paid his own way because he didn't want anyone to think that he was doing any of this for money. Now, my wife, as I was sharing with her yet last night what my message was about, she said, please don't you know, spend too much time on this you know, about being paid for doing ministry. I said, okay, I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. But here's the deal. He, he wanted to make sure that people knew it was not about him. It was not about enriching him. It was not about his platform. It was not about how many likes he could get. It was always all about the people. And so he paid his own way all the way. Now here's the thing, and I hope you won't forget this. Character like water, always flows downhill. Character, like water, always flows downhill. It never flows uphill. And that's for people who have a good character or a bad character. If the person at the top has great character, impeccable character like Paul, then everyone below looks up to him and says, oh, I want to be like that. And Paul often said, hey, watch me Imitate me as I follow Jesus. By the same token, if the person at the top has no character or no moral compass and is in character problems, it will filter down to everyone else. Because everyone's looking up to the leader and going, well, if he can do that, if she can do that, well, I can do that. And so as a leader, your character, your moral integrity is of the utmost importance. So let me ask you, what character flaw right now is keeping you from being the leader you desire to be? We all have them. And uh, Galatians 5, 16 and verse 22 through 23 says this. Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves but the Holy Spirit produces fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We become people of integrity not by kind of willing it and doing self-discipline, but by submitting ourselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, and he transforms us and changes us. Here's the last thing that Paul did. Paul relationally stayed connected to those who saw things differently from him. He returns to Jerusalem. He meets with James. They're talking, man, God's doing amazing things with the Gentiles. James is going, God's doing amazing things with the Jews, by the way. They think this about you, and we think you need to do this to to invest in this relationship, to let them know that you're okay, that you love them, that you love the law. And so what does Paul do? He's willing to go shave his head, to undergo seven days of a purity rite so that people will know that relationally he has integrity, that he loves the law along the way. And here's the thing, it's just really important to know. You cannot have a huge impact on people unless you're relationally connected to them. In fact, the quality of your relational connections to people will determine the impact of your influence. And so let me ask you, today as you think about your children that you're trying to lead, or your spouse as you seek to lead one another, or the people that you work with, or the people that you coach, or the people who come alongside of in your neighborhood. What is your relational connection like? Who do you need to invest in? Who do you need to connect again with? Because here's the thing, unless someone is moving towards you emotionally, 
You cannot have any influence on them. And Paul understood this, that he had to remain connected even with people who disagreed with him. And I tell you, in today's world, that is increasingly difficult. Because if you don't agree with me, if you don't see politics, if you don't see religion, if you don't see these social issues like me, if you don't think like me, you're out, you're cut off. I don't have anything to do with you. And yet here Paul is saying, and here's what Paul did. He was willing to interact with people who saw things different from him. And because he maintained that relationship, he had influence. And he led them, many of them, to Christ. So let me ask you this morning, what kind of leader do you really want to become? And as you think about these things that I've spoken about, what area in your life do you need to grow in? And I want to challenge you just this week to grow in one area of your life? Do you need to grow intellectually about some things, about your faith, about your work, so you will have more influence? This week, do you need to do a deep dive with the Lord and, and discern your why, maybe for the first time? Or maybe to recapture your why? Or maybe this week you need to just get back and say, Lord, I know I'm highly reactive and I just, when things go wrong, just say, Lord, help me trust you. Help me build a foundation that stays in the chaos. Or maybe there's something morally that you need to lift up to God and ask forgiveness for and deliverance from. Or maybe there's a relationship that you need to mend, a relationship you need to invest in this week. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you do. And I want to just pray for each one of us that we'll take just one step this week and allow God to work a change in our hearts that will increase our leadership for the cause of the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the example of the Apostle Paul. And I pray that we will look up to him and then in many ways as we read his words that we will follow him as he followed you. And Lord, I pray that you will help each of us this morning since how important our leadership, our influence is in the lives of other people. And Father, help us this week discern and have the courage to change one thing about our leadership this week that will move us closer to you and closer to the person you want us to become. In Jesus' name, amen.